Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon um, to everybody, and thank you for joining us for this um, CEO virtual town hall. Um, I have just a, a few updates here. Um, if you're on a committee or if you're on the board, you probably heard these already. So if you can be patient with me. If you're not, then some of these some of this information will be new for you. So um, first, I want to thank the um, all of you who were participating in the members of the corporation meeting that took place on May the 2nd. Um, I also want to thank the team, my team, for uh, their preparation. Um, as all of you probably know, after these past couple of years, is that sometimes a virtual setting um, has its own set of challenges. But, you know, after having several meetings and having discussions about what could happen, you know, we, we, um, um, had some solutions ahead of time. So really my, my hat goes off to Carrie, Anita, Michael, James, um, and anybody else who actually helped us on the back end of that because it, was, uh, it worked out really well. And to all of you that were part of the members of the corporation meeting, um, if you either um, presented a motion or a couple of motions or you did a committee report, and obviously those of you that were in the voting process, we really, really appreciate that. Um, definitely it is our hope. We were thinking maybe it's a 98% chance that we hope that next year we're gonna be in person. Um, at the members of the corporation meeting, we had the opportunity to um, recognize Trish Otter, former CEO of UCP of Greater Cleveland with the Kathy Mall Award, and also Glenn Harger, the former CEO of UCP a mobile with the with the chair award. Um, the two the two of almost twenty motions or so. The two motions that um, impacted the bylaws um, were that nominations committee um, is now uh, renamed to the governance committee, and the reason for that is that they're going to be covering some more responsibilities, like folding in the ad hoc bylaws committee. Um, so, so it's not just going to be um, nominating, but it's also um, they'll be responsible for overseeing um, and assisting with updates and revisions of the um, bylaws and prepare them in the future for approval at the, at, in the, at, the at the members of the corporation meeting. Um, in addition to that, um, the ad hoc research committee is now a board standing committee. Um, so those were the two significant ones. The others, um, other motions that were passed and all of them were passed had to do with reports, minutes, so forth and so on. Following that, if you had an opportunity, um, we had our annual conference and that annual conference took place on May the 3rd through the 4th. Um, we had, according to Zoom, um, the first day we, we had uh, approximately 356 um, people attending. They could have attended at different times, but that's what Zoom is reporting. With RJ Mitty's keynote being the more popular session, on day two, a 260 day, I'm sorry, 260 um, folks were attending on day two. Um, just uh, I, to highlight here, the two keynoters, RJ Mitty, as you know, a film actor and an honorary member of the UCP National Board of Trustees and Mr. Neil Jacobson, who is an alum of Crip Camp and also founder of the Ability Corp. Both of them were our keynoters and both of them have cerebral palsy. So we were honored that they accepted our invitation. And this is my hope that, that um, all of you were there for um, their presentations. If not, we will have recordings and I believe we might have a recording ready. That same day, the day two of the annual conference, we recognized Con Congressman Stephen Cohen of Tennessee with the 2022 UCP Legislative Award. Um, the Con Congressman Cohen has recently introduced a bill that would provide $5 million for four years to the CDC earmarked for cerebral palsy research. And in addition to that, the bill included a $500,000 a year for four years to update the strategic plan at the NIH. Um, any, any questions right now related to the members of the corporation meeting or annual conference? We, we are sending the affiliates, if we haven't sent it as of yet, a survey just to get your input on the, on the conference itself. It'd be, it's important for us to, to know um, how 
what was your experience? Um, what did you think about? We had several panelists, we had speakers, um, and we had these presentations. So it'd be good to, to hear from you because we always want to enhance the conference and the members of the corporation every year. Um, the next is, um, and I think this is probably, this is very new because this just came out on Monday at the, at the board of trustees meeting. And I think it's a vital, it's a vital um, announcement is that at the board of trustees meeting during the sustainability report at Ed Matthews recommended that, that national and the affiliates convene this summer in person to address the needs of people with disabilities, also discuss membership models that would include individuals and families. Uh, in addition to that discussion that happened at the Board of Trustees is that we would be inviting self-advocates and other national organizations. And then in that meeting, it's our hope that we would incorporate the results into the strategic plan. So uh, we're looking at this July um, stay tuned for more information. Um, we may have some scholarships um, that would help you get to, um, and we're, we're thinking of Dallas for those that need that. So um, it's just, the information just came out right now. We're, we're gonna be meeting on a weekly basis and we'll get that information out to you. And it is our hope that we can get your input and participation for this convening. Um, in, in addition, and this is really important for, for me, is that in addition to the, what I've been doing for almost five years, the, these town halls, the RAC meetings, the memos that I sent out, the newsletter, the CEO message in there, we've had some virtual national updates during COVID, um, and some of you I've actually visited. I've gone to your affiliate and either you've invited me or I've gone to a function, um, or I've actually participated in some of your events virtually, I'm going to add um, a new, there's an app called Candly or Calendy, and that's C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y. Some of you may know about it. Um, it's a program and it's an app that can actually schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's a lot easier than, say, Carrie trying to connect with one of your assistants and trying to figure out our calendars and trying to put in a one-on-one. -on -one. This is basically a very simple process. You go to the Calendly, um, you go to my Calendly, you look for those dates that are open. I'll have maybe um, perhaps two, three hours a month or so, um, 20 minutes. Uh, so we can talk. If we need to talk some more, then you just place your name in there. That's it. And then I'll know who I'm going to be meeting with. So that's going to be going out. I'll be sending instructions next week of how, how to get in into this app. Um, then the last piece here is that I think you know that, that the national office in Washington, DC, we've ended our 11 year lease um, and we're moving to Virginia. So we're, we're moving into a, a facility that has the same, the same type of amenities that we have now. Um, it's the Source America building. It's a beautiful building. Um, as you may know, um, currently we're paying 62,000 a month. Um, we will now, and I think I reported this at the members of the corporation, meeting, we, we will now be paying 1500 a month um, going to um, this new location. Um, there's a lot of flexibility there. We're not um, um, required to be there for 10, 15 years. It could, be, it could be one, two, three years. And it is our hope as we continue to have these deep discussions about national um, and about the affiliates that we perhaps, my recommendation would be is that we would be moving back to DC at some point. Um, any, any questions on what I presented or anything else that perhaps I didn't present and you have any questions for me? And if you're asking me something, you might be on, you might be on mute because I don't hear anything. Okay, um, hearing none, then it's, um, it's my honor then at this point um, to present Dr. Mark Gormley. Um, he's a pediatric rehabilitation medicine physician at Gillette. Um, he treats children and adolescents who have cerebral palsy, brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, neuromuscular disorders and other conditions with a special interest in spasticity management 
He joined Gillette in 1993. Dr. Gormley received his medical degree at the University of Louisville School of Medicine in Louisville, Kentucky. He completed his residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Tufts Affiliate Hospital in Boston and completed a fellowship in pe pediatric rehabilitation medicine and traumatic brain injury at the University of Michigan Medical Center. Um, Dr. Gormley is a distinguished uh, member of the UCP Board of Trustees at National. And it's my honor, uh, Dr. Gormley, I've worked closely with them in the past couple of years. He's also part of the UCP Research Committee. So with that said, an honor to introduce you, uh, Dr. Mark Gormley. Thank you, Armando, appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, all right. You can go ahead and put up the first slide. Uh, I'm having trouble with this, uh, we'll, we'll sharing do. my screen on this side. So during this, during this whole process of uh, being on the UCP Research uh, Committee, it's, it's been one, Amondo's been uh, unbelievably helpful. Uh, the whole board has been helpful. Keith, it's been, Graham's been helpful. Uh, and uh, over the past year, we've uh, developed this research uh, uh, committee uh, quite well. And I'm gonna talk a little more specifically about that. I'm gonna talk about research a little bit as well, but I want everybody on the line to kind of understand kind of what we're doing and what our direction is. Uh, we had to pick something to start with uh, when we uh, uh, started this research uh, committee, and we picked cerebral palsy uh, because it's uh, it's part of the UCP's base. Uh, but it's not going to be exclusive to that. I think that initially we're starting off with looking at early intervention or, uh, and early treatment as uh, uh, preferably looking at uh, supporting that type of research. But ultimately, we're going we're to look at adult services and all the other different services that the field edge provide. And so what we want to do is want this research committee to be supportive of all the affiliates, not just specific ones, and uh, hopefully to, uh, to help develop a, a care pass and uh, uh, treatment and uh, allow some commonality. Uh, there is a, um, an initiative uh, or, or a conference, I should say, an initiative through uh, the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. Uh, this coming August in at Emory, and they've invited the affiliates, and I'm, I'm mentioning this now because I don't want to forget, they have invited the, the uh, any affiliate uh, that is interested to come and to get some training in early detection of cerebral palsy. Now, what the early detection means is less than a year of age and, and, going th and helping develop uh, whatever resources you have, whatever resources you're lacking, uh, trying to work within those contexts to, to provide some of those services in early detection. So, for affiliates, we're going to be sending out this. This just came up uh, this week. Uh, we are going to be uh, uh, sending out uh, uh, messages to the affiliates that if you are interested, and it's the uh, August 12th through the 14th, if you're interested in uh, uh, attending virtually or going in person to Atlanta, uh, the, uh, the person that's leading this charge, uh, Dr. Uh, Natalie uh, Mater is going to uh, provide a one-on-one -on -one, uh, support for the, for the uh, UCP affiliates. So um, I wanna uh, let everybody know that and we'll get, you'll be getting some more information about that. For those All right, you go ahead. All okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, it, it, and actually, there's a third slide, Armando, but I don't think it matters that much because the first slide, uh, the second slide, is really basic. Uh, research is, um, yeah, we can just stay with this. Um, these are this is a couple of my more favorite quotes regarding uh, 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 knowledge. Uh, is this, uh, Charles Darwin said, it, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. And then Mark Twain said, it, it, it ain't one don't, you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And so I think this is a, a good example of uh, what happens when we think we know what's going on. Uh, and we're really confident uh, about what we feel. Uh, no, you can, <laughs> you can go back to the other one. I was going to talk a little bit more. But I was going to give you a couple examples. Can you go back? There it is. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's just going forward. There we go. All right. Whoop. <laughs> that's what I'm going to stop there. Okay. All right. We'll stop there. That's all right. 
that works. Uh, so there's a couple of examples. Uh, I don't know if y'all know the ghost map. It's the study of cholera back in the 1800s in London when they had a big cholera outbreak. At that time, the dogma was is that, and, that, and all the, the scientists and physicians felt that uh, uh, these, this infection and cholera was from bad humors and smell. And so it was the bad smell of the slums that was causing all the disease. Uh, and there was an epidemiologist that just wouldn't take that. And he made a map of everybody that was dying and went through the uh, the slums of, of London. And basically he helped develop germ theory and then that, that evolved from there. But people were confident and they laughed at him, but it ended up he was right. And it was through his diligent research that he came about uh, uh, to help with germ theory and, I, and actually came up with mechanisms to uh, uh, eliminate cholera from, uh, from London. Now I'm from Kentucky. I'm from, I grew up in the heart of the horse industry. And there's another study. There's a, a medications called bisphosphonates that are medications used for most commonly for elderly women for osteoporosis. And they use it in horses because it's supposed to decrease fractures and horses are like deer with people on their backs running really fast. And so they got these spindly little legs and they break down all the time. So they started, uh, uh, they thought, what well, if it works for uh, elderly uh, women with osteoporosis, it should work for our horses. So they started putting on it. And what they found was, is, is that, and they were confident it was going to work, but what they found was is that the horses were actually breaking bones more, and they uh, were breaking down more, and when they went and investigated it, what they found out was is that, in actuality, it wasn't preventing fractures. It was actually increasing fractures because it was not allowing for bones to heal as readily. It was decreasing the amount of calcium coming out of your bones, but it wasn't allowing it to go back in, and that's what bisphosphonates does. And so through their research and Delta research, they eliminate it. Now horses are made, you know, they, they're running and they make money. And so they, they were sh sure to stop using bisphosphonates in race horses, but we're still using them for women uh, that have osteoporosis. They don't make as much money as race horses. Okay, go to the next slide. So these are just a couple, two couple examples of where research really changed what the dogma was and what we were overly confident about. Now I had a urologist when I was in residency who, uh, had a mother who uh, lived in London uh, back in the uh, 1920s, and she uh, worked in a lab with Alexander Fleming. Now, Alexander Fleming was a, a scientist that was looking at bacteria and trying to study it. Now, he, he had a bunch of people that were working in his lab, a bunch of uh, mostly young women, and was working them to the bone, and they would bring in their lunch because they worked through their lunch hour. He was telling these stories that when they would come in, they bring in, uh, they bring in their lunch, they would, what they were discovering was is that as they had these petri dishes and they're trying to grow bacteria, the ones that got bread mold on them wouldn't grow uh, bacteria. And so they hated that. They hated when they got the bread mold. And uh, so they're telling Dr. Fleming uh, that, you know, they hated when these bread mold, he's like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, when we get bread mold on the petri dishes, they don't, uh, uh, they don't grow bacteria. And so he, he got a, a great idea, go, well, let's study the bread mold. So it found that that's where penicillin comes from, from bread mold. And uh, this gives you an example of a petri dish with bread mold on it. And that was serendipity. It was just the women coming in, bringing in bread. And they didn't look like the moldy bread here, I'm sure. But uh, bringing in enough spores that got on the petri dishes and grew. And he found out from that uh, in that regard. And uh, you also get un unexpected confident, uh, consequences when you do research. Uh, we did a study looking at urinary tract infections after surgery in our, in our hospital at Gillette. And what we found was is that the longer you leave a Foley catheter in their bladder, the more likely are to develop urinary tract infections, and that's a bad thing. So we decided we're going to pull every urinary, uh, every Foley out after at least within 48 hours. So we did that, and we found that the urinary tract infections went down quite considerably. But then what we also found was is that in children that had surgeries called a rhizotomy on the lower part of their spine, uh, they started having urinary retention. They didn't have urinary retention before. So we went back and retrospectively looked at their data and found out that uh, what was happening is, is because we were pulling the catheters early, that uh, the bladders were shutting down. And most of the bladders, if you leave the bladder, if you leave the catheter in for five days, they didn't have urinary retention. They were having urinary retention between days two and five. And we had the catheter in previously and they didn't have that problem. And so once we started leaving the catheter in longer, it eliminated that issue. And that was a bigger problem than having urinary tract infection. So again, you can do research and you can do it serendipitously and you can have you can be really confident about certain ideas and, and concepts, but uh, you have to continue to look at uh, the information that you're given and the consequences of uh, the changes you make and with additional research to make sure you're doing the right thing. All right, next one. So in clinical medicine, there's a couple of different types of surgery uh, research we look at. We look at what's called clinical medicine, which is more kind of global. 
and uh, it looks at adding knowledge about human disease prevention and treatment. So for example, a clinical research may be, does salt increase the risk of high blood pressure? Now that doesn't tell you about treatment, it just sees what, what is a risk factor. Same with fatty foods and cholesterol, heart disease. And then also another uh, type of clinical research would be incidence of genetic disease and, and cerebral palsy. One of the chairs of the uh, research committee, UCP research committee, Michael Kruers, world renowned in uh, looking at uh, genetic diseases and cerebral palsy. Uh, but again, that's not treatment, that's looking at kind of incidence and what risk factors may be. Now, translational research is a segment of that. And translational research is taking knowledge and trying to apply it uh, to a treatment to affect a disease. So you're basically trying to treat a disease. And so does a medication uh, uh, help high blood pressure? Does treatment of infants of cerebral palsy improve? Uh, uh, if you treat them early, does that improve uh, their uh, outcomes? And so that would be translational. And that second one, treating uh, infants with cerebral palsy and early diagnosis and treatment, does that alter their life course is uh, one of the initial initiatives of the uh, uh, URC. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna break down, there's different types of studies, research uh, studies that you can do. And I'm just gonna give you some basic examples of that. I think most people understand this, but there's case studies and that's looking at three or, few pa three or fewer patients. And people may think, okay, well, that's only uh, in of one. That, what value is that? Well, if you have a rare disorder, that could be very valuable. So I'm in a clinic, a complex movement disorder clinic, and so we get rare genetic disorders in there. And we have children that have various different movement problems. And uh, there's a, a procedure called a deep brain stimulator that can help some children with movement problems. And sometimes we don't know if that's a good idea or not because we don't have experience with these rare conditions where there may be 30 in the world that have been identified. And if somebody has gone and done a case study and reported, uh, they had one patient that had this exact same genetic disorder and they did a deep brain stimulator and it was effective, then that gives you a little bit of solace that this may be a good treatment option for them. And if enough people start to do that, then you can collect all that data together uh, to uh, help optimize treatment. Now, probably the most common way of doing research is what's called a retrospective study. That's basically going back and look at old medical records and trying to tease out information to see what associations are, are there and the information you got to look at treatment and prevention and things like that. And the urinary tract infection uh, study was uh, uh, one of those studies, so like a retrospective that I, that I illustrated. Uh, and the problem with those are is you have data that are oftentimes missing and there's biases that go in there. Now, the gold standard for research, however, is the randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. That's basically taking a group of patients, divide them into two or three groups, uh, assign them to a treatment uh, protocol, and one of those treatment protocols being placebo, so they're not they're getting some kind of sham treatment. And the physician or the therapist or whoever's involved in that care don't know, the patient, the family don't know. The only person that knows is the pharmacist or whoever may be yeah, uh, uh, organizing the treatment, the only ones that knows, and they don't tell anybody. And so then you try to figure out uh, is, it, uh, uh, is it the treatment that's working or is it just the placebo effect that's working? Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so even though the randomized placebo control trial is the gold standard, it is fraught with all kinds of uh, 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 issues as well. Now, it is necessary to get FDA approval to go through a randomized uh, placebo controlled trial because that is the best way of doing a study, and it is very, very uh, effective in, in trying to figure out information, but you can have certain biases and, and issues. They're expensive and time-consuming and difficult, and I'm going to give you an example. So there was a group in Boston, to, just to illustrate some of the limitations of a randomized uh, placebo-controlled trial, is, is they try to uh, look to see if anybody had studied parachutes and to see if they actually uh, minimize death and trauma when you jump out of a plane. And nobody has done a double-blinded placebo control trial of a parachute. So they decided, okay, we're going to do that. So they're going to do, so they, they took a group of people, they divided them in half, half of them got a backpack with a working parachute, another half got a backpack with a parachute that didn't work. And then they were going to have them jump out of a plane. Now, the problem was, is that they couldn't get anybody to jump from 10,000 feet in the study. And so, but what they did get them to do was jump two feet. Uh, uh, from a plane that was sitting on the ground. And what they found was, is that there was no difference between the people that had a real parachute and the people that didn't have a parachute. So they, were, they published this in the British Medical Journal, which is one of the top medical journals in the world. And uh, it was a very, very well-designed study, except you can, you can understand that there were some limitations to that study. Uh, and so uh, 
they did that in jest just to demonstrate that even the best of studies can have some problems and some biases that are inherent in them. And so no matter what you're doing in research, you always got a question, is this the right thing? And that's why you have to replicate studies and do all those different things, is, is that a double-blind placebo control trial can be very, very powerful. However, there's always limitations no matter what the study is. All right, go to the next one. All right, so I'm going to give you two examples of where uh, a double-blind and placebo control trial uh, came into play, uh, and these are two studies that I was involved in. So this is a study with Dysport. It's like Botox, so the, the medication that you get for wrinkles, but also we inject it for adults and children with spasticity to loosen up their muscles. And Dysport's uh, kind of like Advil versus Motrin. It's kind of the same medication, just a different brand. And uh, this was looking at a, uh, this was a, a multi-center trial. There's like 30 centers across the, uh, the world and looking at what we call a physician global assessment. So basically it had a scale. And if, and if you graded somebody two points higher on this scale, then that, that meant that it was working, it was doing better. So they had three groups. They had a group that had a high dose of, of Dysport, a group that had a medium dose of Dysport, and a group that got placebo. And nobody knew which one they were getting. I didn't know. So I'm hoping that I was on the good end of these determinations, but I didn't know. And what they found was is that 90% of the people that got the high dose did better, that 87% of the people that got the medium dose get better, but 63% of the people that got placebo got better. So 63%. So this illustrates that if we had just done the placebo trial, let's say we didn't have a, uh, a blinded and have another placebo, if we just did the placebo, that 63% would have been a, a statistically significant improvement. So that would have been enough to say, hey, this stuff really works. But in reality, it would have just been a placebo. So placebo always works. But because the real stuff works significantly more than the placebo, the FDA approved this medication for treatment in children. So Dysport is now approved. Now, nope, you got to go back. The best one's left to go. The second half is good. Botox. So Botox, another study looking at the same thing, looking at a group of kids and looking at the modified Ashworth scale. So this is on how tight your muscles are. In this scale, the higher the number, the worse it is. So you want the number to go down when you get the injection. And so in this study, what we did was is we injected uh, these kids and then we measured how tight their muscles were. Now, if you look at these graphs, there's three lines here and the graphs went down, the lines went down. That means their tone got less. That means they were less tight. So that's a good thing. So and again, just like the Dysport study, we had three branches. So we had a high dose and a, a medium dose, and then we had a placebo. Now, all three of them went down, including the placebo. Now, botulinum toxin lasts about 12 weeks and everybody kind of knows that. So if you look at the, the bottom line, the treatment line there, the people that got the real stuff, you notice after 12 weeks, it's starting to wear off after 12 weeks. And that's what you would expect because it naturally wears off. But if you look at the placebo line, it also wore off. So even though people got a placebo, they started getting tighter after 12 weeks, even though they got just a saline injected. So that tells you how powerful your, uh, the placebo effect is. Uh, and if you don't, if, if you have trouble understanding American politics, you can look at these two studies and, and, and it helps uh, illustrate that uh, you, you believe what you want to believe. And so, and that's what happens with placebos. Okay, we move on. So both of those studies got uh, approved because the real stuff actually improved uh, much more. Now I'm gonna talk about translational research. And again, I've already touched upon this and this is real world types of treatments where you take a treatment and you try to see if it has some efficacy in improving uh, the lives of individuals. And so what translational research does, not only does it look to see if a treatment helps, but it also helps developing programs and it adds some structure to your program. So you're gathering, they're gathering the same kind of data, you're doing the process in a, in a way that's efficacious and safe and all those different things. And so that's the beauty of research is, is that it helps you develop a whole program within your setting, within your community that helps uh, uh, the, the treatment protocols, but it also helps in perpetuating that treatment well after the research project is done. And so that's one of the emphasis of the research committee is, is that we're going to focus on a translational research, initially uh, a children with cerebral palsy, but we're going to expand upon that at a later time. And uh, we're looking to establish and improve uh, treatment protocols across all the affiliates at, uh, affiliates at UCP. We want them to feel some value in doing this research and we're gonna support you along the way. If you're new to research, this committee is gonna support you in writing the grants and figuring out what you need and you don't need and, and things like that. So we'll hold your hand through the whole process, uh, but what we're hoping is, is that uh, it'll help develop your programs and it'll allow you to do some research and collect some great information so we can optimize those treatments as we're going forward across all the affiliates. Okay, next slide. All right, so so that was the that was the impetus for uh, the the research committee through UCP. 
and to look at initially looking at cerebral palsy and other related disorders, but ultimately to expand upon that with all the services that the various different affiliates uh, provide. Okay, next slide. So here are the two uh, the co-chairs. I've, I've mentioned Michael Kerr already. Uh, he's a, a pediatric neurologist from Phoenix and Valerie uh, Piercini. She's an occup a nationally renowned occupational therapist and she's a world beater. She, she really has made this uh, committee uh, run uh, and she's in Phoenix as well. And so uh, these two people have really made this happen and they've done a wonderful, wonderful job. I can't say enough about it. Okay, next. All right. So the mission of UCP, I think that everybody here understands that it's indispensable. We're trying to be an indispensable resource for individuals, communities, and families for cerebral palsy and other uh, uh, disabilities. And the URC is wanting to promote the highest and help establish the highest quality care for uh, uh, children and adults with cerebral palsy and related disorders, uh, and then help expand their, uh, uh, their programs. Next slide. So this is just a, a snapshot of what the, uh, the committee is. There's, right now there's 13 stakeholders, at least I think it is. It kind of, uh, we've kind of evolved a little bit from there. Uh, it, the committee, it's important that we address what we think the, uh, the affiliates as well as what the community needs are. And so as part of that committee, we have two people with cerebral palsy. So we wanna make sure that their voices are heard. We have two people who are parents of children with cerebral palsy. So we wanna make sure that their voices are heard. And we have uh, people that are on the board of trustees. We also have uh, a group that are uh, associated with UCP affiliates. And then we have uh, a one representative from the NIH and a, a researchers and clinicians. And so this is an all-star group. This, is, this group is really, really, really good. I mean, it's one of the best uh, CP groups in the world, I, I would say. And we've gotten a lot of help, like I said, from uh, Keith and Armando. So, uh, the, and then also I got to mention Kismet. She's, uh, she's the consultant that we've got involved in. Man, has she done a wonderful job. She has, I, I mean, she's taken it to heart to, to, to make sure that uh, UCP does a good job with this. And I can't say enough about her either. So, so, so it, as I said before, this research committee is looking to support research in the various different affiliates. We're going to oversee funding. You're going to get research grants. We're going to help you vet all that. Uh, we're going to supply some infrastructure and resources uh, for new as well as existing research. So if you already do research, we hopefully can support that and, and promote that and, and advance it as well. Uh, and then also we're looking at short-term goals, but we also, again, the, one of the impetus for this is to establish long-term programs uh, with affiliates that they can continue and helping you develop that along the way. Next slide, sorry. All right. So why cerebral palsy? Well, we had to start someplace. And uh, we started cerebral palsy because uh, that's, that's the, uh, uh, the basic mission and the origins of UCP. It's expanded since then, and we understand that, and we're going to expand uh, our focus as well. Uh, but we started with that. One of the newer things and one of the, uh, the newer treatments that are out there for cerebral palsy is early uh, detection, early intervention. Uh, recent studies have shown that if you, get, uh, if you start to treat a child before a year of age with cerebral palsy and identify it early, then uh, you can actually alter their life course. It doesn't cure the cerebral palsy, but it improves certain elements of that. And so uh, we're trying to promote that. We're trying to, to get affiliates that, that deal with children with cerebral palsy uh, to uh, learn how to detect in, in an infant if they have cerebral palsy and then uh, helping to establish uh, a treatment. So that's the reason why we started uh, uh, in that area. Next. And why translational uh, research? We want to make sure that we're having a direct impact on the on the uh, uh, the patients that uh, the affiliates are seeing. We want to make sure that we're improving the uh, the programs that are there, improving the outcomes and uh, and treatments that are provided uh, through the various different affiliates. And so that's why we focus on translational research. Uh, and then we also want to help develop programs, and that's the best way to do it. And why is the UCP? Well, UCP. Uh, uh, historically has been very involved in research and they're, they're very involved in supporting the community in general. And we thought that by expanding and the research has, uh, has become less of an emphasis uh, in the recent years. Uh, and then so more recently, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, by reviving some of that uh, so that we can uh, help uh, advance some of the, uh, uh, the programs and the various different affiliates and, and provide some commonality. What we're trying to do is trying to provide basically a better service for the, uh, uh, the affiliates. We want to make sure that they, they feel supported and that there's some commonality between the, the various different groups. 
All right. So there's 58 affiliates. There's 39 that serve children, 17 uh, provide early intervention, uh, and there's uh, uh, 20 uh, affiliates that provide some pediatric uh, therapy services. Not all uh, provide uh, C kids with CP, uh, but uh, at least initially, we're going to some of the research grants that we have coming out will preferentially be looking at that. But if there's not a lot of uh, affiliates that have uh, pr that do programs in CP, but there's an adult program that has a wonderful research idea, we're going to support that too. Uh, there's going to be a little, there's going to be at least initially some preference towards the uh, CP initially, but if they're not, if that interest isn't out there, we're going to, uh, we'll divvy up the dollars to the adult services as well. So we encourage everybody to, to submit something. So this is uh, one of the initial, this is kind of an evolving process too, and I'm not going to go over all this in detail, but just to, to tell you that we have some money that's been designated for research and we're doing a pilot program. We're not just going to open up this program uh, uh, all at once. And so the initial pilot program is going to be uh, $60,000, and we're going to do uh, fund uh, two to three studies of about you know twenty dollars to $30,000, kind of depending uh, on what comes in and what, the, uh, what they estimate their costs are going to be. And then we're, uh, we're also in the process of looking at uh, raising money uh, on an ongoing basis, and we're hoping to raise $5 million over the next uh, five to 10 years. Uh, and then depending on where the monies are and what the interests are, uh, expanding the uh, services uh, from there uh, to a more formal uh, research grant uh, program with various different tiers. And I'll talk about that in the next uh, slide. And so these are the three tiers ultimately that we're, we're uh, looking to push for. Uh, there's some entry level uh, ones when you're starting some new research, some basic research, some uh, just a few patients just to try to figure out uh, how to make these, uh, your research uh, program work. Uh, and that's 25 to 100,000 on average. There's tier two, which is 100 to 200,000, and then tier three, which is the upper tier. And this is when the programs get to be more mature, be two to 300, uh, 200 to 500,000 dollars. And in those tiers, you're looking at trying to put together enough information that you could get an NIH grant or something else like that. So this would be a, a really big initiative. Uh, but th these are pretty standard, uh, the one, the uh, one, two, three tiers. Uh, and uh, this is what we uh, we're looking for, uh, pointing to ultimately to get to. All right, next slide. So in summary, so the URC or the UCP Research Committee is gonna provide support to the affiliates. Uh, we will advise on any kind of grant applications if you have them, if you don't need it, that's okay too, obviously. Uh, encouraging uh, some uh, those to, new to research to apply because we wanna help you along the way because it can help with uh, a, a lot of different program development uh, and then new initiatives that you may be interested in. We're initially gonna prioritize grants to the, to the affiliates, but it's not gonna be exclusive to the affiliates. So if, the, if there's an affiliate that's working with a community-based program that really could use some help in this regard, uh, we encourage you to, to put in a grant for that as well. Uh, we will prioritize translational research in CP, but like I said, depending on what comes in and what the highest quality uh, 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 proposals are, we'll support uh, adult and other services as well. Uh, and we'll expand the grants ultimately to all the, uh, the different services that the affiliates uh, provide, even if you don't see kids, but doing adult services. But again, the go goal of this whole research committee is to improve the quality of care and to help uh, uh, develop services uh, at your affiliate as well as in the community. Now, you can go to the next one. I'm going to show you a couple of examples where translational research, and this is my, these are my slides. Uh, and my videos, and I'm giving you my greatest hit. So not everybody looks like it works out this quite this well, but these were all translational research. And I'm gonna show you some of the, uh, the effects. All right, let's, you can go ahead and click on the first one. There you go. So this is a child with cerebral palsy. And she's born prematurely and she has a significant amount of spasticity. And we were wondering this, that if she was treated with uh, specificity reducing uh, uh, injections with botulinum toxin uh, in phenol, if that would help. And this is her a month later. You can, you can click on the second one, second slide, a picture. And this is her a month later. So she had a significant improvement. And these, these kinds of studies is what helped us optimize the treatment of kids with spasticity in our institution and helping them walk. All right, the next one. Here's another example. This is this is actually you can show the first one. This is actually the first patient we treated with uh, Botox at, at Gillette back in 1994. So she's an adult. She has cerebral palsy. She has uh, she's a hemiplegic on one side. She she has a family. She works at full time. Uh, and uh, but she had this one right leg, well the right arm too. She had the right side that was really really tight that interfered with her ability to walk. 
And so she braces didn't work. The sur surgery wasn't effective for her. And so we did some injections. And uh, we'll show you her a, uh, this is her a month later. So it significantly improved her, uh, her walking. She went from walking like 400 feet at a time to working four miles nonstop, uh, literally a month afterwards. So she was extremely happy. Now, the second, the second picture is her 25 years later. Now, she gets injections about every four months, and we've had a, like a, a, some gaps in there, but in general, and she looks almost exactly the same uh, uh, than she did a month after the first injection. So she's had a wonderful, because it lasts, you know, like I said, 12 to 16 weeks. She's had a wonderful outcome, and she continues. She still, she walks, she's in her mid-50s now. She walks better now than she did when she was in her mid-20s. Uh, so it's been very effective. And this, this person in general, I'm not going to tell you the whole story now because I don't have time, but this person in, in general, uh, because of her and her videos, uh, expanded the acceptance of, uh, of Botox uh, it, uh, by the insurance companies throughout the United States. It's a fascinating story, just her. So all right, let's go to the next slide. But again, this is translational research and how, how much it helps in program development. All right, this is a different procedure. This is a rhizotomy. So this is a similar child. He's got spastic diplegic cerebral palsy uh, as well. Uh, and he walks on his toes and we couldn't get him off his toes. And we did a surgery called a rhizotomy, a, a lower part of the spine. All right, go ahead and click the second one. And this is him a year later after that surgery. And his walking is almost normal. He looks pretty good. He looks very good, actually. And then two years later, let's click on that one. This is him running. He's virtually normal. He, you can't see any difference in his gait. Now, th and that's extremely rare to have someone look this good after rhizotomy. But it just gives you an example, again, where some of the translational research uh, can be helpful. And these are the kinds of things that we want to help the affiliates to develop. You may not be wanting to get into rhizotomies or anything like that. We understand that. But it, it, we want you to be able to develop some kind of, uh, you know, improve your programs and expand your programs. All right. Go to the next slide. We expanded our program to Jamaica. I go to Jamaica three times a year before COVID and starting to go again in a, in a few weeks. Uh, and this is the first child we did a rhizotomy on. And this, this again, translational research, we collect the data on this child to look at what the pitfalls and what the advantages and disadvantages of the treatments in, in within that context, because Jamaica is a lot different than the United States. Is it working? There we go. This one has sound, but I'm not sure you can play my video with sound. So this is Tennyson. And Tennyson, um, his mother was a teacher at a middle school, but Tennyson wasn't allowed to go because he couldn't walk. So even though he's bright, he's very, very bright. And we did a rhizotomy, and this is him several months later. He was walking, so he could go to school. Tennyson actually ended up graduating number four in his high school class, and they do the British system, so everybody knows where they are when you graduate from high school, what rank you are. He was number four. Uh, so he started off not being able to go, and now he can go. And now we're doing those treatments. Again, there's a translational research and the support we get uh, for that research is what's made these kind of differences. All right, next, next slide. Uh, I'm going to show you, this is a constraint therapy. This is the early detection, early intervention. This is a hemiplegic child. And you can notice his left arm, he doesn't hardly use it at all. He doesn't use it at all, actually. And trying to put him on there, uh, get him up to do that. And there's a treatment called constraint where you hope you put a cast on the, uh, the good side and you it force them to use the other side and you hope that they develop some skills. So if you hit that. The second one working, there we go. And this doesn't seem like much, but that's way more than he was doing before. And so he's starting to utilize that left hand as a helper. Because he's playing with the ball. You see the cast there. Now, again, all these treatments aren't going to be a cure, but we're looking just to, to start to improve. And if you do brain scans and things like that, you, you see that the actually how the cortex is is organized changes because you do this. It stimulates it and, and it tends to mature and grow where it wouldn't have been before. Now you can go to the next one, next slide. Now, Armando, if you can go from left to right on each one, we'll go from the top and then we'll do the second row and then do the third row. So if you go ahead and click the, the top left one, yeah. So this is a similar child. And this is him trying to bang some symbols beforehand. Now you can click him afterwards. And this is after he completed treatment. And he instantly picks them up and does better with them. 
I just saw him in follow-up last week. He's doing remarkably well. I mean, his left arm isn't perfect, but man, is it really improved. And we continue to uh, to do uh, some constraints periodically on him. I'm not going to go into great detail about that, but if you're affiliated and interested, these are the kinds of things that we would talk to you about if you needed some help. Okay, let's go to the second one. Just give me a couple more examples. Yeah, you can show the second one. Yeah, there you go. So again, lining them up much better, much quicker, much quicker to use that left hand than he was before. All right, you can go to the bottom one. Yeah, there you go. Now, before he wouldn't even play with the Legos uh, very much. And you see he's struggling with his left hand there. All right, you can show the second one. Now he seeks them out. Before he had to be encouraged, and, and now he's uh, pulling things apart and putting them back together and transferring. And transferring is a big deal. I mean, if you watch him transfer from his right hand to his left hand, and when you do that, you know you're utilizing and integrating your left hand, whereas before they just ignored. They never transferred over to the other hand. So these are just some basic examples of, of, of – uh, uh, how constraint induced movement therapy early in uh, early detection early interventions can uh, really alter uh, a child's uh, course all right that's it so that's all i got i think armando does anybody have any questions i think i've run the time we still have time for for questions okay There, there's a question about the UCP research initiative and how to apply. It looks like you can go to oh, research at ucp.org if you're interested in that grant. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that. I should have had a slide on that, actually. That's my, my fault. Yeah. yeah, but it's online and it's open till the end of June. I think June 26th is the deadline to submit. Right. June 27th we have here. June 27th. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. And then it'll be a review process of like a couple months, and then the awards will be handed out in, in uh, September. So uh, this program that's in August, we can't get within that timeline. That's why this is kind of going to be a little bit of a carve out. So if you're interested, and we'll be reaching out to you, but if you're interested, please uh, uh, let us know. To, uh, contact Valerie uh, Piercini, uh, and uh, we'll put together uh, uh, the affiliates that are interested and, and do our best to get uh, uh, people uh, either there or at least uh, uh, involved in that program. Any any questions for Dr. Gormley? So this this presentation will be um, it's been recorded and it will be in the UCP affiliate portal for anybody else that wishes to anybody on your staff or folks that could not make this meeting. Um, I do want to thank uh, Dr. Gormley. Thank you for, for your presentation. Um, every time I watch those videos, you know, I just see a miracle happening. And I, I think you've, you've done a lot of that. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited about the research committee. I think everybody knows that and, and what can be and the impact that we could have, um, not only just with our affiliates, but also in, in the world, really, um, for children and adults with with cerebral palsy. And what I understand Dr. Gormley is that whatever breakthroughs come about through research, it also can um, affect positively those that have other different conditions. So, you know, I, I, I look forward to that. Any, any questions before I, I have a couple of closing remarks here and some announcements? Armando, I, I just want to point out to everybody here that's on the line here, and particularly the affiliates, is that uh, UCP is still a big player nationally. Uh, since I've been on the board of trustees, I can't tell you how many meetings people have asked me to be involved in just because I'm part of UCP. It still has a big influence and a big impact, and we want to make sure that that it still continues to do that uh, in all the different ways that UCP can. So, uh, so I appreciate all the affiliates that are out there and all the work that you do, but uh, we want to continue to try to help you too. 
Thank you, Dr. Gormley. Uh, so a couple of announcements um, at the, the next Corley Town Hall meeting, and, and thank you, Cheryl, for this. She introduced us to uh, Mr. Chris N Newland. Uh, Chris Newland is the Executive Director of the National Children's Advocacy Center in Huntsville, uh, Alabama, um, and he will be speaking to all of us about uh, child abuse prevention and intervention services. Um, that's August 11th, 2022. Please note that there is a time change because we wanted to um, facilitate the time for, for Mr. Newland. Um, and it's gonna be, instead of uh, noon Eastern time, will be at one o'clock Eastern time, but you will get information from Carrie and maybe you've already got that information. But then also quick announcement, um, the South Rack is meeting in person, October 6th through the 7th in, in um, Orlando. And then the West Rack and the Northeast Rack are um, contemplating in, I'm not sure if it's gonna be a virtual or if it's gonna be an uh, in-person meeting in June. So stay tuned for more information. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being on this call. Um, this was a great presentation, Dr. Gormley. Oh, I, we do have a question, Cheryl, yes. Um, I was just gonna share that, um, and thank you very much for today's presentation. Um, I did wanna share about the next one. We, um, Chris Newland is a parent of a, a young adult with significant disabilities, and he has a personal interest in tracking maltreatment and issues and statistics related to disability. So it will not be just a general um, uh, child abuse and neglect topic that you usually hear. It will be actually centered around our populations. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl, I appreciate it. All right, so with that said, then everybody have a, a great day and thank you so much for being on this call. Goodbye. Bye.